God's word is sharper than any two as a sword. And it is. We know that God's word is powerful. God's word changes lives. It changes lives. Verse number 32, Ephesians chapter 4, even as God for Christ's sake has done what forgiven you, Lord help us. So Paul, he's talking about this invisible enemy, isn't he? This invisible enemy. These, of course, of course, we, we know something else about this invisible enemy, Satan. He can take away from our abundant life, can he? He can, that's what he wants to do. I can't understand it. I'm living the best Christian life I can live, and I'm still not happy. I still don't have the joy that I need to have. You know, you know the, end of, the end of our situation, the end of our day, or whatever it needs to be, we need to be able to say this. This is a beautiful song that I heard years ago. After all I've been through, I still have peace. After all I've been through, I still have joy. After all I've been through, I still have love. God has been so good to me. That's the attitude we should have. Satan wants to steal that, doesn't he? In John chapter 10, verse number 10, the Bible says, The thief cometh not but to steal. Isn't that right? And to steal and kill and, and destroy. But he said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He wants to take your abundant life away. But you know what I, I've committed to do? I've committed to enjoy my life all the way down to the last drop. Like Martin Luther King said at one point, you can't run, walk. You can't walk, crawl. You can't crawl, move something. As long as God gives me breath, I'm going to be moving something. And I'm not going to be moving it for Satan. I'm going to be moving it for God. I'm not going to be moving it for the invisible enemy, but I'm going to be moving it for my God, which is in heaven. The Bible says in John chapter 4, verse number 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I want you to notice some things here as we look at putting on the whole arm of God. Here in Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verse number 13, where, wherefore take unto you the whole arm of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to what stand. He, he keeps talking about standing four times. Look at the next time. In verse number 14, Ephesians chapter 6, Stand therefore, having your loins gird about with truth. And we talked about that, the belt, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. We're going to have to stay righteous, right? And your foot shone with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, keep in mind, he doesn't have, it doesn't say put on some flip-flops. <laughs> You're going to have to put on some boots, some war boots. We at war. We're at war. You know, sometimes our situation in reference to war, uh, remember the Old Testament, you know, we, we had a wonderful time dealing with this, and I think Brother Joseph had this particular class of Brooks, Brother Brooks, I, I can't remember. But remember we were talking about Samson and, and how Samson, he was at war with the Philistines on and on, and God's people were always at war back then. But keep in mind, God's people were at war even when it came to Canaan land because those were evil people. And God tells them in Deuteronomy chapter 7, he said, I want you to destroy all of them. You, you might say, this is hardcore, God. I, you know, you said don't kill and everything. But this, this situation was when God used a nation to serve his purpose, his punishment. Now, Today, we don't go out and attack any group. But guess what? God has already put it into Romans chapter 13, verse number 1 and following. Remember, he said the government, God uses the government now, doesn't he? In order to discipline and punish people. Notice what it says now in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 through 6. It says that 
The government does not bear the sword in vain. You know that emblem, that little sword in the emblem that we have? It's a sword. It means that the government has the right to do corporate punishment. Back then, God used his people to do it. But now, we, we are still at war now. Don't, don't get it wrong. We're still at war, but yet God uses us in, order, in other ways in order to fight the battle of Satan. And then keep in mind now, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And so if, if you and I get a group of people and go and try to fight this group or that group, uh, we could be on the wrong side of a coin. And, and so this is why uh, Paul says, and so beautiful in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse number 18 and following, he says, he said, don't repay anybody back. He said, vengeance belongs to the Lord. Back then, God had already laid out, right? I want you to get this enemy, kill them, whatever, because God knew exactly what he was doing. Do you not know he knows exactly what he's doing now? This, this war that we're talking about, we fight this war every day. And the enemy is invisible, and the enemy, of course, uh, uses people in order to deal with um, deal to get his job done. So my, my main point is don't let him use you as an individual and we're not going to let him use us as a church. And that's why we must stay right and do the will of God. Now, uh, that the uh, things uh, people did uh, to you in the past, you know, some people say, well, I tell you what, uh, I'm fighting this battle because uh, People have done some things to me in the past, and this is why I really need this armor on. Well, that's good and fine, but if you are a Christian, you have forgiven those people in the past. You know, anything someone done for me in the past or whatever, I forgive them, and I hope they forgive me. I'm moving on. So, you know, leave that alone. Leave that alone. And, and, so, and, and say knows that um, he can't get you that way. But, but yet, Satan, uh, people are victims of the enemy, not the, the, and the core of everything. Uh, a lot of times we say, well, if I can just remove this person, if I can remove that, this person. Remember what Paul says, he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Don't try to remove someone. Don't try to hurt someone. Don't, do not try to call down fire on your supervisor. God is dealing with it, isn't he? He's dealing with it. So, so you need to put your energy toward serving God, putting on the whole arm of God, and living a righteous life. Let me show you this. Satan, he, he deals with us so strongly. Uh, the problem is the unseen enemy is, uh, we mentioned the church versus the state, but now we need to deal with individuals dealing with individuals and then this is why the church must be at a point where we we go throughout the world telling people the truth because we are God's marching army we are the ones the kingdom of God we are the ones that are to spread the word of God now now notice what the home does now Tessa uh, what do we get from the home the home is very important we raise our children up to be the way that they should go. You know, we're to raise them up in the way they should go. And that's what the church is for. It is to make sure, it is the manifold wisdom of God. This is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses number uh, 10 and 11. It is God's uh, manifold wisdom of God, God's best idea. His son, son is summed up in the church. What, what do we do? See, this is why if you're not growing in the Lord, you need to check yourself because you ought to grow in such a way when trials come, when an invisible enemy comes upon you, you'll be able to stand. And, and that's, the per that's why we need good teaching like we have here and halfway good preaching like we have here. <laughs> well, that's why we need this because we need to be able to be armed, don't we? We need to have this sword, right? The sword of the spirit because when trials come, we need to be able to stand no matter what. Let me give you these other points. Uh, Christ, kingdom, of course, is not of this world. Where is our battle taking place? Where is our battle taking place? And, and here it goes. You're taking notes. At four, four, four places, our battle is taking place, if you're taking notes. Here you go. Number one, the mind. 
Number two, the home. Number three, the workplace. And number four, the church. Some say, well, Brother Moore, no, I'm safe in the church. Say no, does not come up in there. Just, just keep on living, for. Just keep on living. Keep on living. How does it, the battle take place in the mind? In Ephesians chapter 4, remember we mentioned earlier that we can be built toward one another, right? We, now, that's a fight, isn't it? We need to put on the whole arm of God. We need to be kind in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 32. So uh, the battle is in the mind many times. It's in the mind. Then secondly, the home. In Ephesians chapter 5, remember Paul talks about, he, he, he talks about, it's so beautiful, he talks about husband, love your wife uh, as Christ loved the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 25, husband, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And then you look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. See, that's a battle sometimes, isn't it? That's a battle to do the right thing in spite of he may not be doing everything he should be doing. She may not be doing everything she, uh, she's doing. But, but then again, you have to do your part no matter what. I was talking to someone the other day. I said some people think marriage is 50-50. No, it's 100% Steve and 100%. In other words, you, thought you should give 100%, and the tester needs to give 100%. Because if not, Stephen said, well, Natessa didn't do A, so I'm going to shut down over here. She didn't do B, so I'm going to shut down over here. She didn't do C and D, then all of a sudden Natessa looks at him, she starts shutting down. If everybody shut down, <laughs> well, nothing get done. Yeah. Yeah. Same with the church. You know, that's a battle even in the church, right? Well, ain't nobody doing much up in there, and I am, I'm not going to do anything. Don't worry about that. Just do your part. Because in the end, we're all going to have to stand and give an account. Isn't that right? To the Lord. So, see, sometimes things don't get done because people worry about the other person. And say, that's how he works, right? That's his infrastructure through our minds. And then... And then our home right here where, you know, if the wife's not submitting herself, uh, you know, and the husband the head of the house, and the uh, lady said, she asked Brother Keeper, she said, what if my husband's a crazy head? <laughs> he said, well, you married that crazy head. You just got all that crazy head. That's why, I remember I said earlier, marrying the Lord, right? Because that devil is something else. Now, now okay, you got the mind. You got the home, and next you got the workplace. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 5. It says, servants, uh, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, uh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto who? The Lord. Uh, not with our service as men pleaser, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That is, right? And with goodwill, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So uh, this is why God knows everything you do. Well, you know, I've just been working hard all those years and don't nobody appreciate me. God does. God sees everything, doesn't he? And he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. You must be careful about it. Don't, do not quit. Don't, don't faint. In Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7 through 9, he said, be not weary of well-doing, you will reap it, you faint not. So you're working unto the Lord, even as a housewife. If your husband does not appreciate you, don't worry about it. God does. He does, and he sees everything, doesn't he? And then, that's a, that, so that's a workplace. You got the mind, he deals with the mind, he deals with the home, he deals with the workplace, and then he deals with the church. Uh, the church is so important. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 21. Uh, the Bible says, for above all principality and power and might and, and dominion and every name which is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. In verse number 22, Ephesians chapter 1, and has put all things under his what? Feet. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And this is why if you Looking at this program from afar, you're not here. I want you to know that Jesus only has one church. He died for one church, one body. 
And here he says the church is the body. In the same chapter, look at, look at Ephesians 4. Look at Ephesians 4, verse number 1. He says, Ephesians 4, verse number 4, he said, there is one body and one spirit. Okay, the body is the church, so there's one church. In Romans chapter 16, verse number 16 and 17. Salute one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. So there's one church, one body, and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling. And one Lord and one faith, one faith, one system of faith, and one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Paul is saying here, now, Satan, he will work through the mind, he will work through the home, he'll work through the workplace. Lord help us, he'll work, for, he'll work through the church. But you know what he keeps us, keeps saying? He said four times, stand. The enemy will try to remove you from your standing position. He'll try to remove you from your standing position. Matter of fact, those that have wrestled, I'm sure Brother Davis have wrestled uh, one time or two, and uh, you know, you get your little stance, don't you? And, and that the other person and the opponent is trying to move you from your position. And God is saying, don't let them do it. Don't let them do it. Just continue to stand. So this word scheme, the wise of the devil, the devil is, uh, he, he, he is a created being. Notice this now. He, he is not so bad as, as people think he is. He is a created being. Being. Uh, in First Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, he is as a rowing line. Similarly, he's not so bad. And you know, God is in control, isn't he? And that's why uh, Jesus said, get you behind me, Satan. Because God, because uh, Satan was using Peter, right? To hinder him from going to the cross. And sometimes Satan can use your children, your spouse, your friends, even some of your best friends, Satan can use. And later on, you find out they were not so best at all. Satan is a, he created, he's a created being. Now, now notice this, he can't do everything. I know he has influence because y'all see what, which way the world is going, but he does not know everything about you. God does, doesn't he? He does not know. This is why he didn't know everything about Job. You know, he thought he could get Job, didn't he? But God knew, didn't he? He used everything. Well, you just take those old toys from Job, the toys you, you have given him, and Job would curse you to your, to, to your face. You know, you wonder sometimes, this is why relationships are kind of rough, even when, you, when you're dating. Some of y'all wouldn't know about this, but <laughs> when you're dating, you don't know the motives of these people. But God knows the motives, doesn't he? And, and you know what I urge you to do? You just keep your motives right. And God will work it all right. But see, see, Satan has motive, doesn't he? But, but Satan does not know everything about you. He did not know Job. Job would stand no matter what. Nor have Satan has all power. He's a deceiver. He wants you to think he has all power. Tell Jesus, just bow down and I'll do this and I'll do that. Satan doesn't have the power to do all that. And, and you know, that's why it, it's almost like so many people get caught up in the Hollywood scene of wanting to be a star. And you all know how many people really make it, right? And then the people that do make it, you don't know what they went through to make, to make it. And you don't know how Satan used them to make it. And that's what Satan wanted to do. Satan wanted to do the same way like those producers do. Well, if you, you let me be your agent, I'll, I'll do this and I'll do that, and you'll be a star and everything else. And, and they don't even have that to give. You know, you want to you wanna bypass doing the right thing and that's, that's what sin is, is missing the mark, isn't it? It's crossing over. Uh, a few more points and the lesson will be yours. Uh, Satan, he has uh, these five primary areas that, that he deals with us. Here's some primary areas that deals with us, if you've taken notes. Uh, Satan wants you deceived. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, he deceived Eve, didn't he? He deceived He wants to deceive you. And, and that's why everything glitter and gold. Y'all don't hear me, do you? God looks at the heart, doesn't he? He will deceive you. And, and what, when it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And then uh, he wanted Eve not to honor God. See, when we sin most of the time, it, it's when we start disrespecting God. 
And, and so uh, there's, there's action, the, the, um, there, there's action uh, versus uh, honoring, and we must honor God. Um, then also we see, and this is upon the first one, uh, Satan wants to deceive you. And James says, in James chapter 1, verse number 21, he says, James said, don't go through the motions. James says, don't just be a hearer, but doer. So that's how we get seen, Satan. That's how we override him, right? We, we are just doers of God's word. We walk by faith and not by sight. That's how we override him. Um, and then that's that, be- that's that belt of truth. Now, li- listen at the second way that uh, Satan gets us. Uh, he wants us to compromise. He wants us to compromise. Uh, there's no compromising when it comes to the word of God. That's right. You know, well, just, just come with me and sit at the bar and uh, we'll have our conversation. You don't have to drink with me. You don't have to drink with me. Uh, I just want you to come and sit and keep me company. No. That's a compromise. Because sooner or later, you, you know, you'll get closer and closer to doing those things that are not right. Amen. I want you to turn with me quickly to 1 Corinthians 9. Look at 1 Corinthians 9. Paul realized that we are in a battle. We are in a battle, and, uh, and we don't need to be compromised. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse number 22, Paul says, he says, To the weak became I weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And that's exactly what we want to do. You know, we want to make sure that we do everything we can to win someone Meet them where they are, take them where God would have them to be. But that doesn't mean that we compromise. It doesn't mean that we compromise. And, and, look, and, and, and look at verse number 23. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partakers thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may attain. And every man that striveth for the magistrate is, temper, is temperate in all things, disciplined. Now they do it to attain a corruptible crown, but we, what kind of crown? An incorruptible crown. You see, if we continue in the faith, we'll be able to get that incorruptible crown. In Revelation 2.10, the crown, crown of righteousness. Can you imagine, Brother Michael, how hard the people train for the Olympics? That's why the United States wins so many medals, because they, they train from a child and on and on all their life. And, and they get a corruptible crown. But we just keep training and we just keep serving God and being serious. Like, can you imagine if we had serious Christians like that? I mean, and that's what God is saying. You're going to have to put on a whole armor. Uh, I love this part. Look at 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, verse number 26. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, uh, but uh, but fight I not as one that beateth the air. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm not just shadow boxing. I'm not just shadow boxing. You know, those, those boxers, you know, they come out, even when they're getting ready to fight their opponent, they coming out shadow boxing. Isn't that right? Uh, and Paul is saying, this life is not a shadow box. Um, I know Jessica, she, she played uh, basketball in high school and, and then in college at that level. And uh, I know it was a different story when she got in college. Because they were not playing around. <laughs> they were not shadow boxing. The question this morning is, how are you living your life? Are you shadow boxing? Are you really, really serving the Lord? When we played, brother, why on the half court when I was young, we playing on half court, and, and, you know, we played shooting and imagining that we were on in, with the NBA uh, shooting the final shot, one second left. You know, we were just playing around that we didn't have to discipline ourselves or nothing else. But no, God has sent you on the real stage. You have both courts that you're playing on. And Paul, Paul is saying this here. Listen to what he says. He said, but I keep under my body, in verse 27, and bring it under subjection. I must be disciplined. I must make sure. Listen to what he said. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself shall be a castaway. You know, even I, I think about that a lot. All that um, I preach and talk, I myself must live up under the same rules. And I don't want to be a castaway in the end. 
Now, I gave you two, and we're going to have to close, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you another one. The, the other one is how Satan uses us he, uh, in complacency. Uh, he'll get you more concerned about your position than in, in life versus your calling in life. Sometimes people want to be a certain position, a certain fame and glory, but your calling is found, and Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and following. He said your calling is, your vocation is Christianity. That's our real calling. And he would, he would make you complacent, and you must make sure he does not do that. Look at, listen at the fourth one. Satan wants you to be discouraged. He wants to get you to get discouraged. You know, when you sin, when you blow it, oh, you know you can't serve God now. I mean, you know, you should have known better than that. Man, don't nobody do that, man. <laughs> it's almost like the young man had his father's wife in 1 Corinthians 5. Even the world of people don't do this. Then you say to yourself, I, mean, I thought I had it. God, keep in mind, take heed lest you fall, because you can fall any time, right? And so he wants you to get discouraged. And, but we must make sure that we must keep advancing for the Lord. We must keep advancing for the Lord. How are you going to go from this point on as you leave this particular worship service? How are you going to picture this invisible enemy? This is how you should picture the invisible enemy. That Jesus has overcome the invisible enemy. When he died on the cross of Calvary, that's why the cross was so important. That's why Satan did not want him to go up on that cross. When he died, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he took the keys of hell and death. Remember I said earlier that the young lady was saying, one thing I fear, I don't want to go to jail and I don't want to go to hell. Guess what Jesus is saying? If you obey me, you won't, you won't have to worry about going to hell. You'll go to heaven in John 14 this morning. It's up to you, right, to decide where you want to go. You make that decision, don't you? And God said, I, I'm not going to force myself on you. I'm not going to do that. I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock. And it's up to you to let him in. Let him in. I don't know about you, but I know each day I have to keep letting him in. Keep letting him in because Satan want to come in. Satan knocking at the door also, right? right. Satan knocking at the door. But no, Lord. I'm going to serve you to the end. You heard the word of God. You've been so patient. You, you, you ought to believe it with all your heart. Repent of your sin, Luke 13, 3, and 7, you repent, Lord, likewise perish. And then confess the sweetest name on Mark's tongue. And then be buried in water, grave of baptism. Keep in mind, I said earlier, those that are watching from afar, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, the church of Christ, the only one that's found in the Bible. Oh, come. This morning, as we stand and sing a song of invitation.